أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فأما الإنسان إذا ما ابتلاه ربه فأكرمه ونعمه فيقول ربي أكرما رب الشحف صدري ويسر لي أمري وحده أنقذ من لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله أمين يا رب العالمين ثم ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Beginning with the 15th ayah of Surat Al-Fajr So if you'd like to follow along you can grab a mushaf uh, The 15th ayah of the 89th surah So 89-15 Before we took the break, we were talking about the beginning 14 ayat of this surah and we learned that Allah Azza wa Jal began with some profound oaths and then went straight into the legacy of those powerful nations that outdid the Quraysh in many ways that Allah destroyed anyway and called upon a reflection on the people beginning with the Messenger himself وسلم, how that could be, how could he destroy such amazing nations. But after all of this criticism and the last thing we read was a threat from Allah inna rabbaka labil mirsad But he doesn't say labil mirsadi lahum Your Lord is ready in ambush but he doesn't say ambush for them He didn't spell it, spell it out for them So it's there but it's still not direct <coughs> The thing about a warning One of the things that can undermine a warning is what's called a diffusion of responsibility What that simply means is if an entire group of people are warned, they all basically take less responsibility because it's a large group. They say, we can handle it. We've got each other's back. But if you warn an individual, then the warning penetrates deeply and it has an impact and it has an effect. So the, this psychologically, this is called a diffusion of responsibility, right? The responsibility gets distributed among the people and nobody takes charge. How is he going to, especially look at it from the humanistic perspective. When the Messenger والسلام, is speaking, the, those who disbelieve, they don't see that this is the word of Allah. What do they see? They see this is the word of a man. And they call him insane and they call him all these other names. So what are they worried that he's going to bring down the nation? They don't think like that. That doesn't cross their mind. So now you will see an amazing shift in the surah from threatening the nation because that's what happened in the beginning of the surah. Allah was threatening the very stability of the Quraysh, the nation. Now there's going to be an intifat, a shift to Allah Azza wa commenting on the individual human being. فَأَمَّا insan. The ayat are now beginning to talk about the individual human being. So there's a shift from the collective to the individual. Fa here, in the beginning, this, this harf of atf, this addition, actually illustrates that the word, that what is about to come is somehow connected to that which came in the past. And there we find some commentary on this among Al-Alusi rahimahullah's commentary. Also we find something said about this in As-Sabuni in his Safat al-Tafasir. And the summary of which is, that in the previous we read about the worst kinds of rebellion. Two big key words were, أَلَّذِينَ اتَّغَوْ فِي الْبِلَادِ فَأَكْثَرُوا فِيهَا الْفَسَادِ There was tughiyan and there was fasad. There was the two key words of rebellion. The surah before it had another two words. The other two words were, Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the previous surah, إِلَّا مَنْ تَوَلَّى وَكَفَرَ إِلَّا مَنْ تَوَلَّى وَكَفَرَ The two words then were, the one who turned away and disbelieved. And here, actually first we were told, the reasons for that turning away and disbelief, that was tuhiyan. And then we were told the, cons- the, the consequences of that rebellion, which is al-fasad. So فَأَكْثَرُوا فِيهَا الْفَسَادِ but now Allah tells us basically where this journey begins. It doesn't begin with a nation, it begins with human beings. A nation doesn't become corrupt, people become corrupt, individuals become corrupt. And when, then, when enough of individuals become corrupt, the entire nation is now, فَأَكْثَرُوا فِيهَا الْفَسَادِ الَّذِينَ تَغَوْ فِي الْبِلَادِ فَأَكْثَرُوا فِيهَا الْفَسَادِ So the journey to corruption begins with the individual. And now Allah will talk about the beginning of this journey for every human being, which is a very subtle and, and uh, unexpected place. Allah Azza wa Jal says, إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ Usually we expect in, in Arab we say, إِذَا بْتَلَاهُ As for the human being, when we test him. But Allah says, إِذَا مَا And مَا يَدُلُّ عَلَى التَّعَجُّبُ Even when, and each and every occasion, when we thoroughly, thoroughly test the human being. Allah says about Himself, when He thaw, His Lord, رَبُّهُ 
thoroughly test a human being. In the Arabic language, there's a word for testing imtahana. Imtahana, like for example, فَأُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ امْتَحَنَ اللَّهُ فِي قُلُوبِهِمُ التَّقْوَىٰ That word imtahana in Arabic means to test someone without putting them through pain. Then there's bala, like إِنَّا بَلَوْنَا هُمْ Right? كَمَا بَلَوْنَا أَصْحَابَ الْجَنَّةِ And that word bala means to test someone with some difficulty, a harsh kind of testing. Then there's ibtila, which is to test someone with the worst kind of testing. Like really, really rigorous, difficult, harsh kind of testing. This is the kind of testing that word is used for Ibrahim alayhi salam because his tests were pretty tough. So Allah Azza wa says, وَإِذْ ibtala Ibrahim رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتِ Right? So that's the tough word. Now Allah uses that word for tough testing, that rigorous kind of testing. And He says, how does He test him? فَأَقْرَبَهُ وَنَعَّمَهُ He's testing him. And as a result, first of all, He causes him to be honored. Ikram in Arabic is to cause someone to be honored. Karuma in Arabic, to be honored in and of yourself. And some, no one is called kareem in lughatan, nobody's called noble in Arabic, unless that nobility is recognized by others. So you don't just call a person noble. The word kareem you don't use for them anyway. You use it when other people start showing them respect. Now this is kareem. Or other people start commenting good things about their character and stuff like that. Now this person has kirama. Allah Azza wa says, the first tough test Allah gives this person is that He, he makes him respectable and noble and distinguished in society. He earns a kind of distinction in society, a prestige. So he makes him worthy of prestige in society. How is this tough? This seems like this is a good thing. And on top of this he adds, subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa na'amahu. Other places in the Quran we find, wa an'ama, an'ama Allahu alayhima. Right? Sirat al an'amta, in'am. This is tan'im, this is a different pattern in the Arabic language. Which implies this has actually more mubalaqa in it. What it means is, first he causes him to have prestige, then he thoroughly and abundantly gives him things that make his life easier and softer and relaxed. From everywhere he turns, he's got blessings and comforts and you know, these sorts of amenities that are available to him all around. So Allah does two things for this person. One, you can think of it outside the home. The other, you can think of it inside the home. Outside the home, he's been honored. And inside the home, he's got all these luxuries and all these amenities, right? So it's personal and public. Both ways, his life is, what you would say, life is good. Life is good. He's got a good reputation and he's very, living a very luxurious life. But Allah calls this a very difficult test. Allah, the language here suggests, this is a very difficult test. Usually most people when they go through like a job loss or poverty or bankruptcy or foreclosure or sickness, loss, basically loss, then they think this is a tough test. But when life is good, you get a job, you get a promotion, you have a lot of savings, business is good, it's growing, the house is paid off, cars have been paid off, etc. etc. When finances are good, you think this is good. That's the test, but this is, I made it, I passed the test. And sometimes in the back of the corrupt mind, the corrupt mind, because the previous ayah did talk about fasad, that they increase corruption, a kind of corruption that even takes place inside the mind, is that the more you have in this dunya, maybe it's because Allah loves you more. So the more you have is a sign of the more Allah loves you, which is actually a big, big corruption. Allah gave some very, very bad people a lot of wealth. Allah gave Fir'aun a lot. Allah gave Qarun a lot. And Allah, some of these people had a lot of prestige too. They had a lot of prestige. People listened to them. People gave, you know, gave nobility to them. Some of the worst, worst, most humiliated of the kuffa were the leaders of Quraysh. But as far as the Quraysh are concerned, are they humiliated or honorable? They're honorable. But who gave them that prestige and that honor? Allah did too, right? So the same things that you would think are there because Allah blessed me are actually in the end. What is the reality of them? They are a difficult test. Now what makes this test difficult? The other test is difficult because obviously you, it's tough on you. Maybe it's financial, maybe it's health, maybe it's loss of family, etc. Those are difficult tests. You know what makes this test difficult? It's very hard to actually realize it's a test. That's what makes this difficult. That's why most people fail this test. That test people fail because of lack of sabr, they can't hold themselves, etc, etc. Or they complain to Allah, or they become ungrateful to Allah. This test because you forget that the, in the fact that it's a test. But now this person, something very strange Allah Azza wa Jal puts in his, let's, tells us that he, that he says, فَيَقُولُ Then he says, what does he say? رَبِّي أَكْرَمًا And يَقُولُ is mudari. It's the uh, present tense form. 
and before it there's a tha, which means as a result of this honoring and these amazing luxuries and amenities and blessings that Allah has showered this person with, he over and over, on occasion, he tends to say, he doesn't say just once, يَقُولُ He would have been فَقَالَ In Jumla Sharqiyah, you can use Madi and Mudari. But here what we find is فَيَقُولُ in other words, he just he says on occasion. Every time he finds an occasion, he says something. What does he say? He says, Rabbi Akraman. Now, usually in Arabic, again, I'm going to get a little bit grammatical. You would expect Akramani Rabbi, Jumla Fi'liya. That's the verbal form of the sentence, is what the Arab normally uses. But this is the nominal form, the ismiya form, Muqtada wa Khabar. Rabbi Akraman. It is in fact my Lord who has honored me. He's honored me. Now, how many things did Allah do for him? First note this, how many things did Allah do for him? He honored, he gave him prestige, and he showered him in blessings. But when he speaks, what did he speak about? He says, my Lord has honored me. But did, did he make any mention of the blessings? You see? So the first problem we note is that Allah gave, but he, even on his mouth, didn't even come mention of everything Allah gave. Right? He didn't even acknowledge that Allah has also blessed me with a lot of favor and showered me up with a lot of blessings. All he mentions is this honor is God-given. And in this, there's actually a profound, profound reality that if you study the history of the world, you will find. The, the most corrupt people that had power in the past, like the, the, the runners of false religions and kings, you know what their part of their belief was? That God honored them with that power. That they, they're not in that position for any other reason, but they have divine help. God is on their side somehow. Even the Fara'ina, the Fir'aun, the followers of Fir'aun, they believed that the sun god is on their side. Right? Among the Hindu traditions, you had people that believed that the, the stars are the ones that pick them. And in the Catholic tradition, the king was ordained by God. Right? The god, he's doing God's work, so to speak. So his God has honored him, subhanAllah. So they considered themselves above the rest of the people because by saying Rabbi Akraman, it's Yadullu ala ghayri al ithbat ala ghayri al fa'il. My Lord has in fact honored me like he has not honored anyone else. He's, he thinks of me as special. And since I'm special, naturally as a result, I deserve all these favors. So he doesn't even mention the favors because he feels he's entitled to them. And this actually at the very individual level is a very sick disease. The one who gets so much from Allah starts believing that because Allah has honored him specially, that he's entitled to it. Somehow he's elite over the others. So even though he mentioned his Lord, he said Rabbi, he did mention his Lord. But even the mention of the Lord here is out of arrogance. It's not out of humility. So he says, Rabbi Akraman, oh my Lord has honored me. And now this same person, Allah Azza wa says, وَأَمَّا إِذَا مَبْتَلَهُ why here? Not, uh, what this is a continuation. The atif is a continuation. So it's the same human being. Whenever we, if and when we thoroughly test him again, how do we test him this time? فَقَدَرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَهُ Actually, I forgot to mention one thing. I'll mention at the end of this ayah for both, because it's the same for both ayah. فَقَدَرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَهُ Allah Azza wa Jal says, how it's translated is, He restricts the provision from him, or He lessens the provision from him, or He constrains the provision from him. But that is by implication. By implication, the meaning is haraja, or naqasa, or qabida. These are words for restriction and constraint. The word used is qadara. Qadara in Arabic is to have a very precise calculation, an estimate based on very precise numbers, and to project in the future a, a calculation. Allah uses that word here in terms of this person's provision. He says, when we test him, and we exact the calculation for his provision, in other words, when he loses his wealth, it is part of the risk of Allah. When he had a lot of money, it was written for him. When he lost most of that money, that was also written for him. Allah didn't take anything away or give anything that wasn't already. إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنَّ نَبْرَأَهَا As he says in Surah Al-Hadid. Except that it's already in a book that's already been declared. We've already uh, elaborated, right? So this was part of Qadr. Before Allah even tells us what He says, He tells us what we're supposed to be thinking. The risk that comes our way is not some special... You know, exception to the rule, this was written for us, and the risk that leaves us is also part of what was not written for us. It was that morsel of food was not meant to go in our mouth. So فَقَدَرَ عَلَيْهِ رِسْقَهُ That's how Allah says He takes His wealth away. He calculates, He exacts the calculation for Him. Now He says, فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَهَانًا Then He says, it is my Lord who has, and the word أَهَانًا from Ihana, 
which means to actually make an effort to humiliate someone out of animosity against them. So what this person is saying is, my Lord has humiliated me, but in parentheses it means it is because he hates me, or somehow I've, he's, he's so angry at me for something apparently I can't figure out what it is. I don't know why he's doing this to me. That sort of attitude. That entire attitude is captured when he says, Ahanan. Now, the comment I forgot to make that should be made here is a very, you know, in, in the, the concept of a dhikr wal hadh in the Arabic language and grammar. You can spell a word with a full spelling and you can spell it with partial spelling. So here we find akraman. But grammatically we say akramani. فَحُذِفَتِ الْيَا The ya was taken away. Here we say ahanan. But normally we don't say ahanan in Arabic. We say ahanani. There's a ya there. Now first of all, this is part of the style of the surah. Because there was another word in the beginning where the ya was taken away. Remember? وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَسْرِ It was وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَسْرِ Right? But because the night isn't supposed to stroll, it is unique that Allah makes the night take a stroll. It is unusual, so the unusual spelling is used. That's part of the eloquence of the word there. Here, the 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 hadf is used to actually make an exclamation mark. I this is the conclusive thing. I don't want to add any more. This is all there is to it. This is in fact how to understand my situation. So he says, "My Lord has honored me." In other words, he's honored me. I don't want to hear any more. End of discussion. I know exactly what's going on. My Lord has honored me. And you will meet people like that who will say, who will believe certain things, and if you try to give them evidence and reason and reminder, before they, you even open their mouth, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. They've made up their mind. Similarly, there's a person who's bent upon complaining, Allah has humiliated me. He said, no, you shouldn't say that. You shouldn't talk like that about Allah, about Allah Azza You know, it's a test. Run. No, I don't want, no, bro, you don't understand. He's humiliated me. He's made up his mind. This person has made up his mind I, out of sheer frustration. So what did they associate honor with? When people respect you, and when people give you blessings. By the way, the next ayah did not talk about ikram, and it didn't talk about tana'im. It didn't talk about honoring or giving blessings. It talked about risk. What we learned from that is, what is our risk? It's two things. It's all the physical blessings Allah gives us, and also the honor. The respect that people show us is also part of the risk. Is also part of the provision. And so when that is taken away, for this person and the people around him apparently, the only thing that makes you respectable is your wealth. And when you don't have wealth, you're not respectable. So he feels humiliated when he doesn't have wealth. You know actually our kids start thinking like that. We're, we're actually starting to train our kids subconsciously even to think like that. So if they dress a certain way, if they don't wear certain brand names, if they wear a certain kind of simple shoe as opposed to an elaborate shoe, if they don't get that book bag that everybody else got, right? If they don't have that video game system, they only have the outdated older one. If, if you're, you know, I, I said this last time, if your parents drive an older car, then the teenage kids will ask you to, or even the elementary school, they'll ask you to drop you off around the corner. Like they won't, don't drop me off in front of the school, because that's a humiliate, it's a, it's a kind of humiliation, right? What do they associate honor and humiliation with? With what you own. Similarly, oh, I just live in an apartment, I don't own a home. I'm not going to invite anybody, because it's so embarrassing. Right? Or the wife will say, why would you want to invite someone to our little studio apartment? It's so embarrassing. Right? What are we associating honor and humiliation with? What we own. And these are things we say to each other all the time. This is not some you know, abstract, these kuffar and Quraysh were so evil. This is what we do all the time. Muslims do this all the time. We, think like, we talk like this all the time. Right? So here we, Allah is teaching us, this is, this is the character of insan. Now insan, inst- Allah didn't say kafir, He said insan, first of all, which means all human beings tend to have this attitude. The other thing is we should never forget the root origin of the word insan. Like for example, Al-Farra' comments, uh, Nasiya. It comes from Nasiya. He forgot. He forgot. He forgot where he came from. He forgot what the truth is. He forgot what his master is. He forgot, even if he remembers his master, he forgot what the relationship with his master is supposed to be. You and I aren't entitled to anything if He's our master. All, all of His things are gifts. When He gives them, it's His gift. When He doesn't give them, it wasn't ours to begin with. No room to complain. If you were entitled to something, you can complain. But if you accept He's your master, there's no room to complain because you're not entitled to anything. He's the master. He's entitled to everything. You're entitled to nothing. So everything He gives is a gift. It's a, it's a humility that dawns on the person. But when they have a corrupt relationship with their Lord, then this sinks in. And you know the first step with shaitan, the first step is to complain about Allah, oh, He's humiliated me. You know what the next step after that is? Rebelling against Allah. Why should I listen to Him after He humiliated me? Right? 
I'll, I'll make money my way. I'll go into the haram. Why? Because he didn't let me earn through the halal. He was, you know, he, I, he, I wasn't making enough. I couldn't pay this. I couldn't get that. Now I'm making enough, you know. So you actually openly now rebel against Allah. Remember, Tughiyan was mentioned before, this exceeding rebellion. But now Allah told us where that journey begins. It begins with a corrupt attitude about Allah and the things you own and the things you don't own. You think those are humiliation and honor. Allah Himself says, وَمَن يُهِنِ اللَّهُ فَمَا لَهُ بِالْمُكْرِمُ Whoever Allah dishonors, whoever Allah humiliates, you're not going to find anyone to honor them. They, you think you'll find honor in other things. But if Allah has taken honor away, you won't find it in wealth or health and nothing. There's some of the wealthiest people in the world are also the most humiliated. Bernie Madoff. Extremely wealthy, <laughs> but extremely humiliated, right? This is the case. And there are people who have next to nothing, but Allah honors them in a way you can't speak about them, in, you know, and they don't have massive wealth to show for themselves or enormous assets. But Allah honors them because they, they do Allah's work and they understand the slaves of Allah. So may Allah change our attitudes by means of these ayat. Now at the end of you know, this was insan, the human being. So every human being is supposed to think about himself. But the Quraysh, the Kuffar have come to a point where it is not expected that when the insan is spoken about, they'll think about themselves. They've become so thick in their heads that it has to be spelled out for them. So there's another migration in the surah. Allah says, Kalla balla tukrimun al yatim. He doesn't say, Kalla balla yukrimu al yatim. Not the human being. All of you, none of you, none of you honor the orphan. What do you think I should honor? Allah is basically saying, Not at all. You don't deserve to be honored. Now, Kalla, you don't deserve to be honored at all. You're not being humiliated or honored by any of this. And why should you be honored anyway? Never should you be honored. Why not? You people don't respect and you don't honor the orphan. The reason they should be humiliated is they don't honor the orphan. Now please understand something about this idea of orphan. First of all, most of us, if not all of us, do not know the orphans in our community. We don't know them. We don't know where they live. We don't know what their problems are. We don't know what their financial troubles are. We don't know what when their parents passed and whether they're a single mom that's barely making enough to pay the rent, etc. We don't know. And that's one of the big crimes of the Muslim community that we don't know. We're supposed to know. The second thing here is, as far as the yatim in the jahili society, in ancient Arab society, what yatim meant isn't just orphan. Understand, why is yatim being highlighted here? Because it's someone who doesn't have any support, no family, Nobody to care for them, nobody to ask if they get sick, nobody to ask if they ate or didn't eat. It's the ones that don't have any backing, none whatsoever. These are the people that are yatim. Now in the olden days, even at least the widow would go back to her family in, in Jahiliya. But in the Muslim community, what happens with the widow? She gets, she gets ostracized from every side, right? The orphan, the one who does, just takes shahada. His parents may be alive, but he turns into a, he or she turns into an orphan overnight. They disown him. They don't want to look at his face. Like they, you know, I've heard horrible stories about brothers and sisters who take shahada and how their families deal with them. And the kinds of sufferings they have to go through. So they come to the masjid, we all give them a hug. We say, Salaamu Alaikum. We hand them a pile of books, which they don't, you know, know where to keep or even start, begin to reading, right? And then we're done with our obligation to them. SubhanAllah. But now here Allah speaks about the crime of the Quraysh. You don't honor the, the, the help. Now Allah didn't even talk about them helping the yatim, helping the orphan. He said you don't honor him. Now it's easy to honor the one above you. It's easy to honor and respect your boss, your teacher, the imam of the masjid, right? the elder. These are people easily honored. It's tough to honor someone below you. You know, you don't think about honoring the guy that's, you know, came to do plumbing at your house or mows the lawn. Or, you know, these are low, below, you don't have to honor them. And actually, it's a sickness in Muslim society. People who do manual labor, they're looked at as less than human. Right? And we are the nation that says, you know, we're the people, we have the revelation that says all human beings are equal. Right? And the only thing that gives us uh, a superiority one over the other is a taqwa, which nobody can see because where is taqwa? It's inside the heart. And here you have in the Muslim world itself, in the Muslim world, you have like, you know, this kid from a rich family yelling at an elderly because he works as a waiter in a restaurant and talking to him like he's trash. Just because he's from a wealthy family and that poor old man, he has to make his ends meet that way. SubhanAllah. And we don't just have this across the ocean, by the way. We have it here too. We have, a, you know, this deeply rooted racism and bigotry that you may not even spell out in the masjid, but it's there when you, oh man, those people moved in next door? 
where are they from? Oh, yeah, those guys. And we have these kinds of like, we dishonor people based on what kind of work they have, what race they have, etc. This basically the social crime Allah is blaming, you know, how could you be honored? Why would, you be, why would Allah honor you? La تُكْرِمُونَ الْيَتِيمِ You don't honor the orphan. You don't honor the, the helpless. The, the, the one that doesn't have any support, you should not just be there to help them, but to show them respect. And so treat them like this royalty. This is the tr- tradition of the Muslim. كَلَّا بَلْ لَا تُكْرِمُونَ الْيَتِيمِ And then he says, وَلَا تَحَابُونَ عَلَى طَعَامِ الْمِسْكِينَ Why should you be honored when you don't even encourage each other at all, in any way, shape or form, in feeding those who need? So first was honoring them, and then it was giving them food. Right? Allah didn't mention giving them food first, giving the poor and needy food first. He mentioned honoring the orphan first. So first you honor and respect the needy. Because you know what we do? Here's five dollars, don't touch me. A homeless guy comes up to you. You don't honor him. You give him, but you don't honor him. Right? There's this ikram that you have to do for all human beings. Especially those in need. This is part of our deen. There's no greater da'wah than this. Giving, you could give, you don't have to show your face. You can just write a check, put it in the mail, and some charity organization will take care of it for you. They'll throw water bottles out of a truck, right? Like they're feeding animals at the zoo, right? That's how, there's no honor in that. It's, it's humiliating. Imagine being in that audience that has to pick up that food. <laughs> SubhanAllah. So here Allah Azza wa speaks about first honor the one in need. Then they, he commands or he lets us know that you, you people never even encourage each other in giving to the needy. In other words, you have this wealth, you have this, people respect you, and you have all these blessings, but all you can talk about is vain, pathetic things. Never does it come up. We should help people with, with what Allah has given us. So why should you be worthy of honor? On top of this, and you consume turath. Turath is from wiratha in Arabic. Uh, inherited wealth. Turath also means wealth that comes your way without doing any work. So you love to get free money. You're, you're already rich, you're already okay, but you're constantly looking for a way to cash in. So maybe there's a family member who's about to die and you're thinking not about them, but about whether they're gonna donate some of the estate your way. Right? And you go over to their house not to visit the sick, but to say, did you fill out the uh, will yet? You know? <laughs> You become sick, like you, you don't see human beings anymore. What do you see? You see money. turath. You love to you consume wealth. You consume this free wealth. Aklan lamma. You uh, uh, in a way that you consume it is lam. Lam is to get pile it together. Like if there's stuff spread on a table, you spread your arms out, you pile it together, and then you eat it. Now, what does that symbolize? You symbolize you want to eat everything, but also that you don't want anybody else to get anything. That's how you want to take the, the wealth of the orphan. So Muslims especially look out. You know, these things were criticisms against the kuffar. But we've come to such an amazing time in this ummah, where who is eating the wealth of the orphan? Who's eating the wealth? Who's not giving the sister their due? Or the mother their due? Or the, in the extended, you know, all the recipients in sharia of the inheritance, who's not giving them their due? The Muslim himself. I could take it. I have the Muslim. What are they going to do about it? They don't need it. I need it, etc. Subhanallah. So, وَتَأْكُلُونَ التُرَاثَ أَكْلَ لَمَّا And then Allah tells us the root of all of this. Why should you be honored? وَتُحِبُّونَ الْمَالِ You love wealth. You love wealth. This was, these were all actions on the outside, right? You don't honor the orphan. You don't encourage each other to, to feed the needy, the ones who can't help themselves. Then you love to eat. You, you eat the, the, the inherited wealth or the wealth you didn't work towards and you hoard it all together and like to consume all of it. Then, at the end of all of these outwardly actions, Allah mentioned something inside. And that's the, you know, the last is the worst crime. So what's the worst crime? وَتُحِبُّونَ mad. You love wealth. That's your real crime. You know, in Surah At-Tawbah, Allah actually issues this, this threat to the believers. He says, قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ آبَاؤُكُمْ وَأَبْنَاؤُكُمْ وَأَزْوَاجُكُمْ وَعَشِيرَتُكُمْ وَأَمْوَالٌ اِقْتَرَفْتُمُوهَا وَتِجَارَةٌ تَخْشَوْنَا كَسَادَهَا وَمَسَاكِنُ تَرْضَوْنَهَا He makes a list of eight things. Your, tell them if your parents and your kids and your spouses and your extended families, right? And then the, the monies you love to compile, the, the savings you like to make, and the businesses that you always fear are going to go down. You know, thousands of years ago, people feared business will go down. Today, is it the same? Is it always business news everybody's watching? The economy is not doing so well? The business you feared will go down. Taqshawna kasadaha wa masakinu taqdawna. And the homes you are so happy with. If all of those things, this is basically our mal in this dunya and the ni'mah in our dunya. 
He says, "Ahabba ilaykum min Allahi wa Rasulihi wa jihadin fi sabilihi." If all of those things are more beloved to you, you love those things more than Allah, His Messenger, and struggling in their path, fatarabbasu. You just wait then. Hatta yati Allahu bi amrihi until Allah comes with His command, with His decision. You just wait. Allah issues a threat, and then the biggest the biggest curse of Allah in that ayah is, "Wallahu la yahdi al qawm al fasiqin." It is Allah who will not guide. He will not guide the corrupt nation. He calls these people the corrupt, who love this more than Allah. Here he says about the kuffar, you love money. تحبون المال حبا جمع جمع in Arabic يدل على الكثرة. More specifically, to uh, jam in Arabic is used when you have a like a ruler or a scale, and you fill it up all the way as far as the scale goes, right? Beyond the scale, you're just filled to the brim. That's called right. So you love wealth as it's filled to the brim. It has to be like fully, fully, fully loaded. It has to be that kind of wealth. That's what you're in love with. وَتُحِبُونَ الْمَالَ حُبًّا جَمَّةً Now this was, the human being has those psychological problems. He says, my Lord has honored me, my Lord has humiliated me. It went from there straight to pointing at the Quraysh. تُحِبُونَ تَحَاضُونَ تَأْكُلُونَ Right? These are words talking straight to the Quraysh. But then now again the surah moves in its conclusion as the previous surah moved towards the akhirah. The, su- the previous surah interestingly had the akhirah in the beginning, al ghashiyah right? In the beginning there was mention of the hereafter. Now we're coming at the end. In the previous surah we, we read, هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ الْغَاشِيَةِ And now we're gonna read, كَلَّا إِذَا دُكَّتِ الْأَرْضُ دَكَّنْ دَكَّا When the earth is smashed and pounded. Dakka, okay, is to pound, literally to pound and beat until whatever material it is turns to powder and crust. And then you, you can flatten it out. Allah says, Dakka and Dakka, meaning over and over the earth is going to be pounded and pounded and pounded until it turns into nothing but like powder. And it's just spread, just flattened out completely. You know, in the previous surah, Allah it made us reflect on how the earth is so vast and the, the, the mountains are so strong, such strong pegs on the earth, right? So, وَإِلَى الْأَرْضِ كَيْفَ سُطِحَتْ وَإِلَى الْجِبَالِ كَيْفَ نُصِبَتْ And now in the surah, he's taking that same earth and he's destroying it. He's completely destroying it. He says, إِذَا دُكَّتِ الْأَرْضُ دَكَّنْ دَكَّ Now, in the previous ayat, there was all this talk about wealth. Wealth where? On the earth. And you should know, all that you've saved, wherever you've saved it, what's going to happen to it? It's going to be crushed, reduced to nothing and flattened. Actually, this is the same word used with Musa alayhi salam. فَلَمَّا تَجَلَّ رَبُّهُ لِلْجَمَلِ جَعَلَهُ دَكَّةً Now anyway, وَجَاءَ رَبُّكَ وَالْمَلَكُ صَفًّا 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 When, and your Lord will descend, and the angels will descend, rows upon rows upon rows, صَفًّا صَفًّا Over and over again, rows upon rows of angels are going to keep descending. It will seem like this never-ending army. Now, previously, Again, understand, they were, they were impressed with their power on the earth. Allah is showing them how He's going to show them His power from the sky. How the, 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 angel, the armies of angels are going to descend upon them, subhanAllah. In the previous surah, we were asked to reflect on the sky, and it's a different kind of reflection now. We were told, وَإِذَا السَّمَاءِ كَيْفَ رُفِعَتْ Didn't they look to the sky how it was elevated? And now on that day, when you look at that sky, the angels are descending. You know, one last thing about this, the, you know, the, them loving inheriting, inherited wealth, and them saving it on the earth for them, Allah says about Himself, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَرِثُ الْأَرْضُ وَمَنْ عَلَيْهَا وَإِلَيْنَا يُرْجَعُونَ We are the ones in fact who are going to inherit the earth. Allah says about Himself, He will be the one to inherit the earth. Do you think you're inheriting the earth? Do you think your children are inheriting the earth from you? Your house, your assets, your property, your car, who's in the end going to inherit the entire earth? It is Allah Azza wa Jal. So, وَنَحْئِنَّا نَحْنُ نَرِثُ الْأَرْضُ وَمَنْ عَلَيْهَا Then he says, سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى وَجِيءَ أَيَوْبَ إِذِمْ بِجَهَنَّمَ On that day then, hellfire, Jahannam will be brought forward. According to some mufassirun and linguists, Jahannam comes from the Arabic word Jahnam, which means torture chamber. Okay? So this torture chamber will be brought forth, dragged forward with chains as we learn. Right? It's going to be brought forward before them, and then in the same ayah, Allah says, يَوْمَ إِذِينَ يَتَذَكَّرُ الْإِنسَانِ Because these are two لَازِمَ and malzum. These are things that are going to happen immediately. So it's not even given the separation of an ayah. يَوْمَ إِذِينَ يَتَذَكَّرُ الْإِنسَانِ فَأَنَّا وَأَنَّا لَهُ الذِّكْرَةِ On that day, the human being will remember thoroughly. You know, 
the word yatadhakkaru in sarf is completely spelled. And you can have idgham in it, yadhakkaru. Like, aw yadhakkaru fatanfa'ahu dhikra. Right? In the previous surahs we found, the messenger is, is told constantly, remind, 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 remind. And the, the, the disbelievers, they refuse to remember. Even remember a little bit, yadhakkaru. It's when there's idgham, it's a little less. Even just do a little bit of remembrance, nothing. But here now, يَتَذَكَّرُ insan, The human being will make an effort to remember everything completely. And this, what Allah Azza wa is highlighting here is a contrast. In the previous surahs, the Messenger is saying, remember, remember, remember. And do they remember? No. When the hellfire is brought forward, now they themselves are making a thorough effort to remember every last detail. يَتَذَكَّرُ insan. وَأَنَّا لَهُ الذِّكْرَى And what's the benefit of reminder at that point? What, what will that reminder do now? وَأَنَّ لَهُ الذِّكْرَى So at that point, them, themselves remembering and them being reminded has no benefit whatsoever. You know, in previous surahs we learned, عَلِمَتْ نَفْسٌ مَا أَحْضَرَتْ عَلِمَتْ نَفْسٌ مَا قَدَّمَتْ وَأَخْرَتْ Every person will know on that day what it has to present for itself. Every person will know what it sent forward, what it left behind. Profound statements about what, what they know. Here they are making a, a conscious effort to remember all the things they used to do. يَتَذَكُّرُ الْإِنسَانِ وَأَنَّ لَهُ الذكرى. And what is it that, they, that comes out of their mouth when they start remembering everything that they had done? Everything. They'll remember all of their deeds. So what are they going to say? Ya laytani, yaqulu, ya laytani. He says, and yaqul, yadullu anul istibra. He says over and over again. What does he say? Ya laytani, oh what destruction has fallen upon me. Oh my God, what have I done to myself? These are my modern contemporary ways of helping you understand what ya laytani, mean. ya laytani means. Old English would say, woe is me. But we don't understand what was me anymore. Nobody uses that anymore. Right? What have I done to myself? How, how, did, how, how, how did this happen to myself? I've destroyed myself. And these people are crying over and over again. Then what do they say? Something profound. قَدَّمْتُ hayati. If only, if only, I had invested in the future of my life. قَدَّمْتُ I had sent forward, I had sent savings ahead so I can use them later for my life. What are they calling their life? Their life, real life is in Jannah. I wish I invested for my life. And when they were eating the wealth of the orf, when, when they were not encouraging to give charity, when they were eating the, the inherited wealth altogether, when they loved wealth, wasn't it for their life? But now they realize that wasn't life. This is, وَإِنَّ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَ لَهِيَ الْحَيَوَانِ This is real life. لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ Had they only known. So now he's saying, if I only invested for my life. And these people of dunya, when you invest for akhirah, you know what they tell you? Yeah, I know you gave a lot of charity or you're doing a lot of spending a lot of time for the sake of Allah. You should invest for your future. What they mean by that is for your dunya. And you say, yeah, I'm investing for my future because that's your real future. Right? And then when they get to that future, they say, I wish I invested for my life. How Allah, how Allah changes perspectives. But at that, at that point, it's too late. And you know, this is why in the previous surah, even we learned, لَسْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِمُسَيْطِرِ you're not, you're not there to enforce anything on them. You're not there to enforce anything. They have to remember for themselves. And if they don't, this is what's ahead of them. So we find in Safat al-Tafasir, أَن يَقُولُ نَادِمًا مُتَحَسِّرًا يَا لَيْتَنِي قَدِّمْتُ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا يَنْفَعْنِي فِي الْآخِرَةِ لِحَيَاتِيَ الْبَاقِيَةِ He says, he will say out of humiliation and just this deeply felt regret, if only I had, I had sent forward and acted with righteous deeds that would have benefited me in my hereafter, my real life that is to remain. فَيَوْمَئِذٍ لا يعذب عذابه أحد أي ففي ذلك اليوم ليس أحد أشد عذابا أشد عذابا من من تعذيب الله من عصاه سبحان الله. he says uh, in the tafsir we find a shaukani commenting first I'll translate then on that day there will not be anyone to torture anyone the way Allah is going to not anyone will be torturing his the likes of his torture لا يعذب عذابه أحد not the likes of his torture and so the commentary is, on that day there's not going to be anyone who can imagine a more intense punishment than the one Allah has prepared for the one who disobeyed him. What were the acts of disobedience in this surah? Just take a recall. Just look at the things Allah said are, you think you should be honored, what are the things you do wrong? The, the complaints Allah had waged against these people. And before tughiyan, rebellion, rebellion and causing fasad on the earth. Then he says, وَلَا يُوثِقُ وَثَاقَهُ أَحَدٍ you know, if you're being punished and tortured, maybe there's a hope you'll escape and run away. Right? There's, there's that at least in this world. 
that if there's a bad prison or somebody's going to torture you or is hurting you, maybe there's going to be a window of opportunity where they'll leave the rope or the, the handcuffs loose a little bit and you might run away. Allah says, وَلَا يُوثِقُ وَثَاقَهُ أَحَدٌ And nobody will tie the, the likes of his tying. Meaning the way he's going to bond you and wathaq in Arabic, like it's used in Surah Muhammad, فَشَدُّ الْوَثَاقُ When you capture the criminals, tie them tight. Hold them tight, meaning these captives of war. So there's no chance of escape. Allah says, no, nobody's going to bond them like Allah's going to bond them. Nobody's going to bond them like that, subhanAllah. So this was the case of the criminals. We're reaching the end of the surah now. And there's a profound shift. It is as though, and this taghir, this, this, and this change, and this iltifat, this transition that takes place in the surahs illustrates many things. What it illustrates here is in the previous ayat, we were talking about the rebellious. But it is as though these rebellious are beyond hope. They shouldn't even be talked to anymore. Like Allah was addressing them, and they're so hopeless, He turns away from them to the one that He has hope in. The one that He expects from now. Because this is a lost case. So they shouldn't even be talked to. In Urdu you say, Muni lagna. Right? You don't even address them. You don't even face them. So Allah faces away from them. He turns away from them. And He starts talking to this one, each individual person. He says, Ya ayyatuha nafs al mutma'inna. Oh, tranquil, or he, he says, hey, tranquil, or, or calm down and relaxed person. I'm not going to translate soul, because that's a bit of a bit fuzzy thing in English. But anyway, a lot of translations do say soul. But this nafs is something more, right? This, oh, hey, you nafs that has now become tranquil and calm. You know where this talk, talk is taking place? It's taking place in Jannah. And you know, ya yeah in Arabic is used when you talk to someone. Not when you talk about someone, third person. When you talk to someone, we need second person. Allah is forcing the reciter of Qur'an to imagine his or herself being addressed by Allah in this ayah. He is forcing us to imagine ourselves in Jannah when Allah is talking to us. SubhanAllah. When He says, Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna. Hey, satis- O oh, you satisfied soul. O oh, satisfied person. Mutma'inna itma'inan in Arabic means to be completely tranquil. How are you tranquil? By the way, this surah was about a person who wasn't tranquil. He was only happy when he had wealth. And as soon as it went away, he was disturbed. And he said, my Lord has humiliated me. But the real slave of Allah, this person, he, he didn't let his nafs get taken away by empty desires. So Allah mentions it in another place, فَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى the one, who feared, the, the one who feared standing before his Lord, and he prevented the nafs from vain, from vanities, from empty desires, right? So this person is being, Allah is addressing him now, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Addressing them with these beautiful words, tranquil nafs, oh calm, satisfied nafs. This in and of itself illustrates one of the greatest gifts of paradise, is itmi'nan. It's this calmness, it's this relaxation. Because this is not something we can ever have in this dunya. If you are ever relaxed in this dunya, it's probably 10 seconds. Or like 5 minutes, where you say, oh... And then something comes in your mind. Oh, I haven't done this. I haven't done that. I have to do this. I have to do that. Oh my God, I forgot about that. Something keeps coming up. And no matter what you have in this dunya, there's always something you don't have. Right? Always. Always. There's something more. There's something more. Nobody's satisfied. Allah says about this person, he's finally satisfied. Like there's no urge to get any more. There's no urge. There's no, I wish I had that. It's already there. وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِي أَنفُسُكُمْ before I go any further, I'd like to connect these, the beginning of the surah to the end so we appreciate something very powerful. We spoke in the beginning about the four oaths that Allah Azza wa took, and we talked about the various tafasir in their commentary on wal fajr, wal ayal in ashr, wal shafi'i wal watr, wal layl idayas. We find something really beautiful commented upon by Muhammad al Sha'arawi, Mutawalli al Sha'arawi rahimahullah. Really beautiful. He says those four oaths are also particularly special for the tranquil self. The person who reaches this tranquility is a real servant of Allah, slave of Allah. And what are the most blessed acts of slavery to Allah? Number one, it's the Fajr prayer, right? Abandoning your sleep. Then the slave of Allah takes most advantage of what times? The last ten of Ramadan, the first ten of the Hijjah, right? Walayal and Ashr. Then was Shafi wal Watr, which were the, the, the odd and the even nights of those times as it was interpreted. Some even interpreted it as the odd prayers and the even prayers. Or the even and the odd rather, right? 
And then when Layli Ida Yasr, the night as it's about to disappear, when the night is about to disappear is the is the time to wrap up your Qiyam al Layl, right? Which is the, again the act of closeness to Allah Azza wa and also the time to finish your suhoor so you can what? Fast. So the the acts of closest worship to Allah Azza wa Jal are those times that are illustrated or those uh, what what's alluded to in the opening oaths. And the one who was committed to those oaths, how is Allah addressing that person at the end? Ya ayyatuha nafs al mutma'inna. Now, what has satisfied this nafs? What has satisfied this nafs? Everybody else was running after stuff. What is the first and most important gift Allah gives this nafs? Irji'i ila rabbiki. Return to your master. Return to your master. That's the, that's the thing that was dissatisfying this nafs. That nothing else satisfied this person in their heart. أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنَّكُمْ Just remembering Allah satisfied them. And now Allah gives them satisfaction beyond even remembering Allah, return to Allah. In this there is a profound reality in the life of a Muslim who makes tawbah, or in the life of anyone who accepts this deen. When you return to Allah Azza wa Jal, you face a lot of difficulty. Whether you are a Muslim who is in sin, and they decide they want to change their life and they want to become obedient to Allah. Or you are a non-Muslim who came into a con- contact with the teachings of this deen and accepted this deen. As soon as you become serious about this deen, and you're serious about returning to your master, and really living like you're a slave, then you face a lot of problems. Your family gets in the way, your friends get in the way, your own old habits get in the way, your society gets in the way. Everything around you gets in the way. Maybe even the way you used to earn your money wasn't halal. So you have to lose your money too. Maybe you have to lose your business too. You definitely lose your friends. You always you, you suffer, the, the relationships and family suffer. The marital relationship can suffer. The relationship with your kids or your parents can suffer. All these problems because you did what? Return to Allah. And all of these things are connected with being dissatisfied in life, aren't they? But when you are cut off from all of these things... And you return only to Allah, you find a tranquility you never found before. You know, I've, I've met brothers before whose life was all about partying. They would go to clubs and drugs. Everything that would, they would think would bring them pleasure in life, they tried. They tried it, they did it. And then Allah brought them to the deen. And they said, man, after you return to Allah, that is a high I've never felt. Nothing compares. Nothing compares. There is no, you know, at the end of any of these activities where you try to please yourself or you indulge in these sorts of things, right? This Hellenistic, you know, lifestyle where you just live for pleasure. At the end of all of that, they are so, like, these are the people that commit suicides and stuff. Like, they can't, they're never satisfied. They're never done. They can't get enough. And they think it's going to just bring them to an end. But they become enslaved to their own habits. Right? They're not even, they don't even feel free. They say things like, I can't quit. What do you mean you can't quit? Like somebody has a, it's a master over them telling them you can't quit. And that's how bad it's gotten for them. So you become free from all of that and finally you become satisfied. So irji'i ila rabbik. Radiyatan mardiyat. Two adjectives that are so incredibly beautiful. One, pleased. Pleased with who? With Allah. Why is that important? In this surah, did Allah speak about the one who's not pleased with Allah? The one who re- first who rebels against Allah and causes corruption? Then the one who Allah, when He pr- takes the sum risk and calculates it, he becomes displeased with Allah. Now this nafs, because he's truly returned to Allah, he's just happy, just content with Allah. The world can go left to right, the sun can rise from the, from the west too. He'll still be content with Allah. This, this slave of Allah. Then even more mardiyya, ism maf'ul. And you are pleased with, meaning your Lord is pleased with you too. You are pleased with Allah, and Allah is pleased with you. Return, you are so happy with me, and I am so happy with you. Allah is saying, subhanAllah, ta'ala to this. What an amazing gift. But that's not the only gift. He gives another gift after this. He says, فَدْخُلِي fi ibadi." Enter then uh, in the midst of my slaves. You know, the first gift was in the company of who? Allah Himself. Return to your Lord. The second gift is the company of the other slaves of Allah. You know, this believer read about Ibrahim alayhi salam. He read about Adam alayhi salam. He read about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam. And he read about Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. He read about these people and he said, man, I want to meet them so bad. And what does Allah say after he lets him meet himself? He says, فَدْخُلِي فِي Enter the company of myself. Join. You're part of this group. You can go in. There's no exclusive access. There's no yellow tape, no security guard on the doors. You, no, no access here. This is first class only. Prophets and messengers only. Nope. فَدْخُلِي فِي عِبَادِي فَدْخُلِي فِي عِبَادِي And in comparison to that, what is last? What's the last thing he mentions? فَدْخُلِي 
Jannati, enter my Jannah. The, in comparison to these gifts, Allah put Jannah last, subhanAllah. <laughs> now the last comment about this Jannah. Allah didn't say, وَدْخُلِ Jannah, Enter paradise. He says, Jannati, enter my paradise. Enter my Jannah. Meaning Allah is, you know, almost as though Allah Azza wa Jal wants to show him what special arrangements in Jannah He has made for this one individual person. He's not even talking to the Ummah at large. This address is individual. Fadhudi, irji'i, wadhudi. Individual, individual, individual. Allah individually addresses the person who enters Jannah and says, Come, let me show you my Jannah that I've given to you. Wadhudi Jannati, enter my Jannah. Subhanallah. You know, it's one thing to say, enter your Jannah. But Allah says, enter my Jannah. What a difference. What a difference that makes. Subhanallah. So at the end, this intifat, I want to again reiterate before I close. This transition illustrates that Allah is forcing us. He is forcing us. When you hear these words, these are second person. Who's talking? Allah. Who's listening? You and I. He's forcing us to picture ourselves in that paradise. He's forcing us to picture ourselves in that paradise. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us these slaves of Allah that reach tranquility in this life. May Allah Azza wa Jal let us take advantage of the profound days and the acts of worship that He highlighted in the beginning of the surah. May Allah Azza wa Jal forgive the shortcomings we have in our ibadat, the way our mind wanders in the salawat, the way we, we skip our prayers because of sleep and laziness, the way we waste our nights in, you know, in, in entertaining ourselves or wasting time. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect us from, from all of that and make us amongst His beloved slaves that enter into His company, into the company of His beloved slaves, and into His, his special paradise. Barakallahu li wa lakum fi Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil-ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.